If you have a Bible, wherever you might be, uh, or somebody around you does, you can look on way. Let me invite you to open with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. So as we enter into July 4th week here in the U.S., and particularly in our nation's capital, we obviously think about and celebrate the freedoms we have, including the, the freedom to worship that we're experiencing right now. So I thought it would be helpful to pause in our Biblical Traits of a Church series, we've got two traits left out of 12, and consider biblically how God calls us to live in a government like ours. So specifically how faith in Christ fundamentally transforms how we view and use our freedom. And I think this is critical because if we're not careful, we can subtly and almost unknowingly think about the government the way the world thinks about the government instead of the way God's word thinks about government. In a similar way, we can have more of an American idea of freedom than a biblical idea of freedom. We want God's word to drive the way we think about everything, including July 4th week, particularly here in D.C. and especially in light of current events in our country. You think about the headlines right now. Migrant children being separated from their families at our borders. The Supreme Court upholding an executive order from the president restricting immigrants from certain predominantly Muslim countries. A Supreme Court justice announcing his retirement from the bench this week, bringing debate about abortion, marriage, sexuality, affirmative action, numerous other issues back to the table of our nation's dialogue in a fresh way. And I know there are people all across this church who have all kinds of different thoughts on these issues. We almost kind of tense up because some, maybe even most of these issues are highly charged for many of us. Not just politically, but emotionally. Some of these things are extremely upsetting, emotionally heartbreaking, even exasperating. And as I've said before and will continue to say, my aim is not, is never to offer my political opinions. That is not why you came here today. You came here today because you want to hear the word of God. And I want to shepherd you well with God's word. Not with political opinions, but with biblical truth. I want to show you foundations in God's word that shape, not just the way we think, but the way we live as Many of us are citizens in this country. So what I want to do is I want us to walk through a passage in 1 Peter chapter 2. Then with the help of a few other texts in the Bible, I want to show you two primary truths. So if you're taking notes, two primary truths in Scripture on God, government, faith, and freedom. Along the way, I want to make application to our lives, particularly in light of this week and all that's going on in our country. And then I want to close to two primary truths that will lead to two takeaways at the very end of our time together. So let's start by reading the text, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. This is the word of God. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. All right. So two biblical truths from 1 Peter. And the reason I wanted to take us to this passage in particular, so get the context here. Peter is writing this letter to a group of Christians who were experiencing persecution in first century Rome. And they were wondering, how do we relate to the Roman government around us? Which is a Christless government. They're saying, how do we respond to this? Should we ignore government? Disregard government altogether? Should we resist government in this way or that way? Or should we just be quiet and do whatever government says? So we've got to remember the biblical context here. And we need to keep in mind that the New Testament context is very different from the Old Testament context in the Bible. So in the Old Testament, God's people originated as a theocracy with God as king. Then they became a monarchy. 
But when we get to the New Testament, God doesn't organize his people in a government. Instead, Christians are spread out in society. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 calls Christians exiles who are scattered amidst worldly government for the glory of God. So that then leads to the first truth we see here in 1 Peter 2, verses 13 through 17. Truth number one, we are submissive citizens of a government according to God. From the very start of this passage, the Bible is clear. As followers of Christ, we are to subject ourselves to human institutions and the authority they have in our lives. Particularly, Peter says, to emperors and governors who are over us. This is God's will, this passage says. And the key word, as we think about this, is submissive. We're to submit, to subject ourselves willingly to the government around us, which is A pretty astonishing command when you think about it. And it is a command. Peter's writing this letter to Christians. Either during the time of the emperor Claudius or more likely Nero, both of whom were totally ungodly, even setting themselves up as gods, Nero was persecuting and killing Christians. And Peter says, be subject to the emperor as supreme and to governors sent by him. Do this for the Lord's sake. This is the will of God. That was pretty astonishing in the first century to read. Now we need to realize Peter's only echoing here what Jesus himself taught. In Matthew 22, when Jesus was asked whether or not it was in accord with God's law to pay taxes to Rome, and specifically the poll tax to Caesar, a tax that was especially despised by the Jewish people, Jesus gave his famous response in Matthew 22, 21, when after he asked for a copy of a coin with Caesar's likeness on it, Jesus says, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render to God the things that are God's. So Jesus clearly didn't teach that his followers should disregard government. Instead, Jesus teaches that there are things we rightfully owe government. And paying taxes was not just permissible. It was morally obligatory to pay taxes, even to a pagan king. Morally obligatory. So we are obeying God even on April 15th each year. Just remember that. This is an act of worship to God. (laughs) We are submissive citizens of a government who render to government what government is due according to the will of God. And Peter's not just echoing Jesus. He's also pointing us to Romans 13, which I'm going to put up here on the screen because, well, this text has received some airtime in the news recently based on some statements from the attorney general about it. I want to be clear. My aim is not to comment on what the attorney general meant by his words. But I do want to clarify what God meant when he said these words. Listen to what God says in Romans 13, verse 1. Follow along. Let every person, this is the word of God, be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. The authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. That sounds pretty similar to Matthew 22 and 1 Peter 2, doesn't it? And Paul opens almost the same statement that Peter used. He says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Because God has set them up as an authority for a purpose. And that purpose is evident in both Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2. So if you were taking notes, like the the purpose of government summarized is twofold according to God's word. Why does government exist? One, government is given by God to restrain evil. Emperors and government, Peter says, are sent by God to punish those who do evil. Romans 13, 4 says the government is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrong doer. So government is given by God to restrain evil, to punish evil. And then second, government is given by God to promote good. First Peter 2, 14 says government's 
purpose is to praise those who do good. In the same way, Romans 13 talks about how government is given by God to promote good for people. And obviously one of the ways government pro promotes good under God is by protecting freedoms given to people by God. So let's pause and make some application here. This is why we as Christians view issues like religious freedom, not primarily as political issues, but as biblical issues. We know, celebrate this week, the Declaration of Independence, which says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable, una unalienable rights. Among those are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. It goes on to say, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. But the founders of our nation did not come up with that. The author of creation came up with that. We see this from the very beginning of the Bible. The religious freedom is not ultimately given by government. It's ultimately given by God himself. In Genesis 1, 2, 3, we see that God creates man and woman with the capacity to choose whether or not to obey or disobey him. God doesn't force faith upon his creation. We often talk about God's sovereignty over all things, and God is sovereign over all things. But his sovereignty does not remove or negate man and woman's responsibility. We all have the choice whether or not to obey or disobey God. And we have that choice because God has given it to us. This is clear in the ministry of Jesus. He came to the earth inviting people to receive him or reject him. And many people listened to him. Others reasoned with him. Some argued with him. Many disagreed with him. Ultimately, they all abandoned him to a cross. But he didn't come forcing faith on people. In fact, in Luke 9, Jesus rebuked his disciples for their desire to call down condemnation on Samaritans who were rejecting him. In the next chapter, Luke 10, Jesus encouraged his disciples to respect people's freedom to reject him. Which is part of why we see what we see in 1 Peter. Honor everyone, the Bible says here in verse 17. Even the emperor. Even those who are different from you. Why? Because as men and women made in the image of God, they have the capacity to choose either to obey God or disobey God. And this is why it's good for, well, it's, it's not good for you or me or any government to force faith upon people. And that's not just because of the Declaration of Independence. That's because of the Declaration of God. We don't force faith upon people because God himself doesn't force faith upon people. If you think about it, faith in its very essence can't be forced. In order for faith to be faith, it can't be forced. Faith in and of itself is a willful decision in the human heart to believe or not believe in someone or something. Augustine, early church father, rightly wrote, when force is applied, the will is not aroused. One can enter the church unwillingly. One can approach the altar unwillingly. One can receive the sacrament unwillingly. No one can believe except willingly. Someone has to choose to believe. So based on the Bible, we believe that government does not exist for the establishment of religion, any religion, including Christianity. At the same time, government doesn't exist for the elimination of religion. Government doesn't exist to eliminate or establish religion. Government exists for the free exercise of religion. Religion exists to promote that right, to protect that right, which is why we grieve, right? Again, not based primarily on political grounds, but we grieve on biblical grounds whenever we see governments around the world that restrict or violate religious freedom. Whether it's a totalitarian regime like North Korea or a variety of nations around the world where it's illegal to convert to a certain faith, this is why, church, whenever we see news headlines about North Korea or any other of a number of nations along these lines, our first impulse should be to pray and to work for religious freedom. And specifically to pray and work for the persecuted church around the world. Let's remember this week that the freedoms we celebrate here are not shared by many of our brothers and sisters around the world. Many of them living right now in a setting very similar to 1 Peter where it's costing them deeply to follow Christ. According to our State Department, Christians face persecution of some kind in more than 60 different countries. On average, about 100 Christians around the world are killed every month for their faith in Christ. Some estimates have that number much higher. I chose the most conservative one I could find. 
Literally countless others are persecuted through abuse, beatings, imprisonment, torture, deprivation of food, water, shelter, jobs. And the Bible commands us to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world. Particularly, all the more so on a week like this. We miss the point this week if we bask in our freedom while turning a blind eye and a deaf ear to family, brothers and sisters around the world who long for this kind of freedom. Now, that obviously leads us to ask the question, if the Bible teaches that we're submissive citizens of a government, then what do you do when that government isn't doing what God created it to do? How do you live as a submissive citizen of a government when that government isn't restraining evil and isn't promoting good? Like how do you live when you see a government doing the opposite, promoting evil and restraining good? That's a question our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world wrestle with. And it's a question in varying degrees that we find ourselves wrestling with even here. But again, that's what's so astonishing in these passages. Because Paul and Peter are writing these letters amidst an openly decadent Roman Empire. Filled with idolatry, immorality of all kinds, the abuse of women, infanticide with children, the persecution of Christians. Paul and Peter both killed from but because of their faith in Christ, yet both of them are saying that Christians are submissive citizens of a government. So how do you live like that? And that question leads to the second truth in the Bible concerning God and government, faith and freedom. So one, we are submissive citizens of a government. Two, we are free servants of God. We are free servants of God. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 16. Live as people who are free. And this is not Peter giving a political stump speech. He's not talking about political freedom here. Peter is talking about spiritual freedom. Peter is talking about how Christians have been freed from the power and penalty of sin. And that freedom makes us, into verse 16, servants of God. Now, that may seem like an oxymoron, a free servant. But it's not. Jumbo shrimp, free servant. How is that possible? Well, here's how. Because of the death of Christ on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, all those who place their faith in him, Christians, are free from the bondage of sin to live the life God has created us to live as servants of him. Huh. For non-Christian friends who are here today, Please do not mistake in this room at other campuses what is primary in our gathering right now. We are incredibly thankful for the political freedom that we enjoy in this country. But there is a much, much greater freedom that we are celebrating in this gathering. And this freedom does not come from a government. This freedom comes from our God. We, so follow this, especially if you're not a, a, a follower of Christ, that we were all born slaves to sin. All of us prone to turn from God to our own ways. And all of us as a result are destined for eternity apart from God in our slavery to sin. But the good news of the Bible is that God loves us. God has not left us alone in our slavery to sin and eternal death. God has come to us in the person of Jesus who never once sinned. And then, even though he did not deserve to die, he chose to die for our sins, to pay the price we are due. And then he rose from the grave in victory over sin and death so that everyone, anyone who repents and believes, turns from sin, trusts in the love of Jesus, will be forgiven of all your sin and free from its penalty and power forever. That is the freedom that unites us in this gathering right now. So you think about it. There are people here at other campuses right now who are not citizens of the United States, part of this gathering. And if that's you, we don't want you for a second to feel left out in this service because you are not on the outside of this celebration. We have not gathered today, even on July 4th week, to celebrate our U.S. citizenship. That's not what the church does because that's not who the church is. 
The church doesn't unite around an earthly citizenship. The church unites around a heavenly citizenship. The church is made up of, not of people who unite together under a particular country's flag. The church is made up of people who unite together under a particular cross, the cross of Jesus Christ. We have more in common with a Syrian Christian sitting next to us than an American atheist. Far more in common forever. Which is why when we gather as a church, we put aside national, even political differences. We worship under the banner, not of a country, but under the banner of a king. And that king's name is definitely not Donald Trump. It wasn't Barack Obama. It wasn't George Bush or Bill Clinton. And for that matter, it was never George Washington either. Our king's name is, always has been, and always will be Jesus Christ. And as thankful as we are for the freedom that our government gives us, the purpose of our gathering today and every Sunday all year long is to celebrate the freedom God has given us in Him. Because that's a freedom following us. We enjoy no matter where we live, no matter where our passport is from. It's a freedom that transcends nations and governments. And it's a freedom that we will celebrate with people from every nation for all of eternity. We are free servants of God. It's what makes us the church. Now, with that freedom, so our freedom in Christ, which is ultimate freedom, comes much responsibility for the Christian in his or her country, including the United States. So follow this. Peter says, we use our freedom in Christ. And he talks about two main ways. One, to model good lives. Look at verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to governing institutions. Verse 14, for this is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Then he continues, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. So here's the picture. As a result of what God has done in our lives through Jesus, we're now free servants of his, which means we're free to live not as evil, but as good, doing good. When Peter talks about silencing the ignorance of foolish people, he's talking about silencing slanderous attacks against Christians by non-Christians in the culture around them. Peter's zealous in a Matthew 5, 13 through 16 kind of way for Christians to be salt and light in the culture, country around them. The non-Christians may see their good deeds and glorify God in heaven. So we use our freedom in Christ, not in an evil, selfish way, but in a good, humble, selfless way, modeling the goodness of Christ in submission to the governing authorities over us. We use our freedom in Christ to model good lives. That should be the commentary on our lives in our country. We're showing the goodness of God. And then in the process, second, we use our freedom in Christ to show God's love. So you look at verse 17 in 1 Peter 2. Peter closes this passage with four short commands. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. So how does God in his word tell us specifically to show his love in the country around us? Well, one, we honor everyone, especially our leaders. We honor everyone. Notice uh, this command to honor starts and ends this verse, like bookends. So the picture is followers of Christ showing respect, Attributing dignity, assigning value to everyone without exception. Even people who disagree or even oppose you, honor them. They're made in God's image and worthy of respect. This is why we must be known for honoring the word of God. The word of God is why we honor babies in the womb. The word of God is why we honor people of different ethnicities. The word of God is is why we honor the poor and oppressed. The word of God is why we honor immigrants who have made their home in our country. The word of God is why we honor children and their parents at our borders and on and on and on. Again, I'm not advocating a particular policy or position here. There's room for so much discussion among followers of Christ on these issues. But what is driving all of us in those discussions is we are concerned with showing God's love by honoring all people. Including, did you catch how Peter closes the section? Honor the emperor. It's like Peter saying, especially him. Honor even this man who set himself up as a god over you and leads a government that is persecuting you. For even he is a man made in the image of God and worthy of your honor. 
What a word that we need to hear. The Bible, God in his word, beckons us to honor our president and our government leaders in the way we speak about him and them, the way we pray for him and them, obviously realizing that some presidents and some leaders are easier to honor for some people than others. Some of us, if we're honest, held Barack Obama in high honor and now have a hard time showing honor for Donald Trump. Others of us have much honor for Donald Trump and had a hard time showing honor for Barack Obama. Some have had a hard time honoring either. But brothers and sisters, the Bible doesn't give us a choice here. This is a command. And if Nero was worthy of honor in the first century, then our president and our leaders are worthy of honor in the 21st century. Obviously that doesn't mean we agree with everything a president or a government leader does. We support everything in his or her agenda. But it does mean we recognize that this is a person created in the image of God, that God loves them, that God desires them to know him, that they will one day stand before God as judge. So we intercede for him or them regularly. And we speak about him or them decently. We honor everyone, especially our leaders. It's how we show God's love. Second, we care for the church. The second command there in verse 17, love the brotherhood. It's a reference to the church. We see a priority here, much like we see all over the New Testament. Not just on showing the love of Christ in the world, but particularly showing the love of Christ to one another in the church. The church is in the world together. The church needs each other. Brotherhood, this picture of family. Uh, I don't... I know all of you weren't here uh, or at one of our campuses on Wednesday night for our congregational meeting, but if you were here, uh, you, I trust, were deeply encouraged by a particular story. There were a variety of things that night that were particularly encouraging, but uh, and I wasn't even, I mean, this wasn't even planned. As I was coming into the room that night, I heard about this story. So well, there's a member of our church who had been in the uh, Christian Muslim relations class learning how to share God's love with Muslims and how to share the gospel with Muslims. One day he was out walking his dog just a couple of months ago. He was out walking his dog and met a Muslim from Syria in his neighborhood. And uh, so uh, starts relationship, I mean, just talking with this, this man and ends up sharing the gospel with him. Long story short, over the next couple of months, uh, Keep sharing the gospel. And Wednesday night, when we uh, welcomed new members into the church, uh, this man from Syria was welcomed as a member into McLean Bible Church because that man has put his faith in Christ. And so I, yeah, praise God for, and I intentionally not, not using his name because he's experiencing real challenges right now in his family. And uh, it was just a really powerful picture to be able to say to this brother with a room full of people, uh, you have brothers and sisters all across this room that want to be family to you. Like we have a unity in Christ that transcends political, national, anything else. We are together in Christ. You're a, like a brother to us. This is the picture we, we love, care for, the church in the midst of the culture around us. And then all that leads to this, this last command here, we fear God, which is the key to everything. So everything we've considered must be seen under the umbrella of fear before God. So the Bible is clear. You don't fear the emperor. You don't fear governors. You don't fear men. You fear God alone. And this is huge. Because here at the close of this passage, we realize that even submission to the government, as important as that is, must ultimately done, be done in the context of fear of God. So follow this. First Peter is making absolutely clear that governing authorities, including the emperor, do not hold absolute sway over our lives. 
Only God possesses that kind of authority. Let me say that again. Governing authorities, including emperor, president, whoever, do not hold absolute sway over our lives. Only God possesses that kind of authority in our lives. So Peter is clearly not advocating submission to government regardless of what the government says. Because believers in Christ are first and foremost over and above everything free servants of God. Just think about the language in this passage. We're to subject, be subject to governing authorities. Verse 13 says, for the Lord's sake. We're to obey the will of God, verse 15 says. So if a government is prescribing something evil, then the Christian is not obligated to do evil. Why not? Because the Christian ultimately fears God. Peter's certainly not advocating committing sin for the Lord's sake. He's not saying sin because it's the will of God. And similarly, if the government sits back and allows evil, then the Christian is obligated to do good because we fear God. In the words of Micah 6, 8, we do justice, we love mercy, we work on behalf of the poor and the weak and the oppressed. This is one of the lessons we must learn as the church, right? From slavery and Jim Crow laws in our country in the past, we know that it was not right for Christians to be passive about slavery or Jim Crow. The Bible was beckoning them to work for the good of African Americans. So today we are beckoned, required in the words of Micah 6, to work for good, to love justice, to love mercy, particularly in a representative democracy where we all have a part to play in how our government works. We must use our freedom in Christ to show the love of Christ. Now you start to put all this together. Okay, we're submissive citizens of a government, inclined to submit to governing authorities. We want to submit to them because God has set them up for our good, as Christians, we are also free servants of God, free from sin, to model good lives, to show God's love in the world. So what do we do in circumstances where the will of God and the will of government are in opposition to one another? When the government is commanding or requiring or prescribing believers to sin. Or the government is not protecting and promoting the good of people. And the Bible is teaching, God is telling us that it's Followers of Christ, we honor our government and its leaders. And ultimately, we obey our God. Because we fear our God more than we fear government. So let's apply this practically. In Lon's words, so what? I trust we all know. It's standing on the Bible, sharing the gospel. In our country today is increasingly viewed as narrow-minded, offensive, even dangerous. Many companies, corporations are establishing policies for employees around this room and other campuses that virtually require you to violate your conscience in Christ. Increasing numbers of professions requiring licenses that actually counter Christian convictions. So what do you do? What do I do? What does the church do? What do we doing all of our different jobs when government mandates that we do something that violates our faith in God and his word as a school teacher, a lawyer, an accountant, as a provider of this good or that service. And the answer from 1 Peter 2, Romans 13, Matthew 22 is clear. We honor our government and its leaders. Ultimately, we fear our God and his word. We model good lives and we show God's love in obedience to his word, no matter what that means for us. I think about John Perkins, gospel-believing, civil rights leader, church leader for decades. Dr. Perkins is now 88 years old. During the civil rights movement, he participated in marches, resisted laws that forbid African Americans from sitting or eating in certain places. Dr. Perkins advocated peaceful civil disobedience, was actually on the way to personally post bail for some demonstrators one night in Mississippi when he was ambushed by more than a dozen white deputy sheriffs. They beat Perkins within an inch of his life, along with a couple of others, tortured and dehumanized him. They stuck forks up his nose, down his throat, punched and kicked him until they thought he was going to die, then threw him into jail. So why, after that, did he continue to participate in acts of peaceful civil disobedience? In one of his many books, Perkins writes about Romans 13. He says, Romans 13, 1 through 5, makes clear that every Christian 
And he quotes from it, must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. Scriptures teach us to make every effort to live at peace with everyone, to return good for evil, to turn the other cheek, as a, result, as a rule to follow the laws laid down by government authorities. Even though many emperors were despotic and evil rulers in Titus 3 and 1 Peter 2, the apostles Paul and Peter still instructed Christians to submit to the Roman government. So he acknowledges exactly what we've talked about. And then immediately after writing this, Perkins explains, if your conscience recognizes that a law is evil, it is your responsibility to use the free will you've been given to rise up against it. He says a part of the Christian's faith is to free one's conscience. And if our conscience condemned us, we're in bad shape because God is greater than our conscience. Basically, what he's pointing to there is exactly what 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17 is encouraging us. Like, fear God. He is our ultimate authority. He has given government as good authority in our lives. Yet, if we ever have to make a choice between God, obeying God and obeying government, we obey God. Which is not an easy thing to do. Like we'd like to think it is. We'd like to say, yeah, of course. But the reality is, just like Christians in the first century, this is why we see all these exhortations all over the New Testament. Because Christians were in businesses where they were missing out because of their faith in Christ. They were losing out in this way or that way. They weren't able to rise, advance. And so all throughout the New Testament, we see these encouragements to stay strong, trust in Christ, don't compromise. Because the reality is, it's not just first century. In the 21st century, we can so quickly accommodate cultural norms or mandates here or there out of fear of what might happen to us if we don't. And in the end, we can suddenly find ourselves fearing our government more than we fear our God. It was a constant temptation for the church in the first century. And we would be fooling ourselves if we didn't think it was a temptation for the church in the 21st century. But the word of God is clear. While we want to submit to government in every way we can, we must submit to God in every way he commands. That's what Jesus, Peter, Paul are saying. It's what, that's the exact words of the earliest Christians when they were being commanded not to preach the gospel by the government. Remember Acts chapter 5, verse 27? When they brought them, they set them before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. So how did Peter and the apostles reply? They said, We must obey God rather than men. Which is not the only time that happens in Scripture. Think about other times when the commands of government and the commands of God have directly contradicted one another and the people of God have chosen to obey God rather than government. Think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3. Refusing to bow down and worship the king even when their lives were threatened with a fiery furnace. Daniel, just three chapters later, commanded not to pray. So what does he do? He goes up, opens the doors of his room and prays. Not in private, but in public. Knowing that a den of lions would soon be his fate. Hebrews 11 recounts men and women who were tortured, refusing to accept release so they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. This is the legacy of those who've gone before us. Brothers and sisters in Christ, who when faced with the challenge, chose to obey God rather than men. I fear that if we're not careful as the church in our culture, we, we will be tempted to compromise and obey men rather than God. And I want to exhort us to be a church who loves in a godly way being submissive citizens to a government and ultimately loves in a godly way being free servants who fear God over and above all. So bring this to a close today based on these two biblical truths and their practical application, which we could dive into a lot more. I just want to offer two final takeaways from this text, particularly for us as a church. Number one, let us honor those 
who give their lives defending, defending freedom in our nation. That is a good and right thing to do all across our different campuses today. One of the ways we show God's love. I trust we know that the privilege we enjoy today, this freedom to worship in this gathering, comes at a high cost. Men and women who've gone before us, have fought to defend this freedom, men and women and their families, even among us who pay a high price on a day-by-day, month-by-month, year-by-year basis to defend this freedom in our nation, particularly through serving in the military, which many people in this church have done or are doing. So it is right for us to recognize and honor men and women in different ways all across our campuses, to pray for them, to show God's love to them. So we have one more takeaway, but before I get to it, I want to pause for a minute and I want to show you a video that encapsulates a unique challenge that is faced by those who serve in the military and their families and the power of the gospel in the midst of that challenge. So watch this with me. He deployed uh, about a week and a half to two weeks after we got married. He left to Iraq on a almost eight month deployment. I had served in the United States Marine Corps. A lot of the deployment and things that had happened over there along with my past had, have never been dealt with. Some pretty dark secrets that were starting to come up Coming back from Iraq, life was moving on pretty quick, and I continued doing what I knew best, and that was to just numb myself with drinking. I started to notice a really big change in him. He was so disconnected, so quick to anger, so impatient. I remember just kind of feeling hopeless, rage and anger all at the same time. I went out to a bridge, and these past hurts and this past disgust just kind of came out that day, handed my phone to a security guard and had told him to tell my wife that I loved her. And uh, I leaped off this bridge, uh, attempting suicide. My life changed at that point. I loved him, but I didn't feel like I was in love with him anymore. Four days later, I woke up out of a coma. Around this time, I was also introduced to painkillers. I started abusing. I fell into one of my darkest addictions. I started using crystal meth. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to help Mark. I'm so angry with him because of his continuous choices. So I hear about this program called Mighty Oaks, that this had to work for me. This was either the make it or break it point in my life. Mighty Oaks taught me that no man fights alone, that I have a, a purpose beyond just being a Marine. For once, I could see the clarity in his eyes. I just saw hope in him again, which gave me hope. I got invited to the Women's Fight Club at Mighty Oaks. That's when I made a decision to choose to love Mark. I looked at my kids and it's like, they're so worth it. You know, Mark is worth it, I'm worth it, our marriage is worth it. We didn't get married by accident. Well, we both know our roles and what God said as my role as a husband, her role as a wife. You know, we're not perfect, we're still learning. We're still growing as a couple. We're, we're rebuilding. There's that triangle in our marriage that if we're both, you know, aligning ourselves and shooting towards Christ, you know, things will run according to His will. The tool that I learned from Mighty Oaks was that there's no need for you to fight alone. I've just realized how important it is to have these brothers walk alongside me in life and keep me on the right path. I now have a, a brotherhood again. I'm so grateful for Mighty Oaks because if it wouldn't be for them, military families like ourselves would truly end up divorced and I mean some of our men may even lose their lives. We have an understanding now for each other and I think I have just so much more compassion and love for him than I did before. God has a, a plan. It can be fulfilled as long as I stick to his blueprint. I learned a new purpose and I found my identity in Christ.
And so church family here and other campuses, I want to introduce you to Mark and Iris, who you saw on the video, as well as Gabriel and Tina. So Mighty Oaks is a ministry that we have partnered together with that focuses specifically on bringing the hope and love and peace of Christ in the middle of post-traumatic stress that uh, military families uh, experience the effects of. And uh, we, knowing that we would be honoring, uh, yeah, just doing all that we're doing today, we wanted to invite these two couples out to Washington uh, to spend a weekend here just alone, away from everything else, just together, uh, just bless them with a week in Washington on behalf of our family and for them to be able to see in us a church that uh, one, uh, is thankful in ways we can't even begin to express for how you have served our country and not just you brothers, but your families and the effects of that, we want you to know we are grateful. And two, we are grateful to God for the power of the gospel in your lives. And we want you to know we are uh, not just thankful for you, but with you and love you guys. So thank you for being here this, this weekend with us. So let's, let's, let's pray. God, we, we pray specifically for Mark and Iris and Gabriel and Tina. We just thank you for your grace in them. I won't presume to know or imagine uh, the variety of challenges, valleys they've walked through. God, we praise you today for your grace in them in the middle of those challenges and valleys. We praise you for the hope of the gospel that has met them at their lows and brought about restoration and redemption and peace and hope and joy. And God, we just praise you for the fruit of the gospel in their lives. We, we, we pray for many others like them, many others who we honor and Thank you for this week. God, no, are walking through all kinds of challenges. God, we pray that the power of the gospel would meet them and, and restore lives. I just think about somebody I was talking with in the lobby after the first service who uh, lost a family member to PTSD and suicide. God, we just pray for your mercy, for your grace, and uh, for the, your blessing on Mighty Oaks' ministry. And, uh, and on these brothers and sisters, as they minister to others out of the overflow of your grace to them, we just, we pray that the gospel would spread in power through this ministry in ways just like what these brothers and sisters represent here. Thank you for your grace in and through them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you thank God with me one more time for these guys? Thank you. Man. Thank you. Man. So th these lives, I trust, are a reminder to us. Just to kind of bring it all down. A reminder to us that freedom in our nation, or any nation for that matter, is not the ultimate goal for which we are living. So this is the second takeaway. One, let us honor those who give their lives defending religious freedom in our nation. And then two, let us give our lives, spreading ultimate freedom among all nations. So we have a mission as the church of Jesus Christ, and that mission is clear. We proclaim the gospel to hurting hearts right here in our country and all over the world. We want people all across Washington, D.C., from all kinds of nations and ethnic backgrounds to come to know the ultimate freedom that's found in Christ alone. And we don't want to stop 
here. That's why we have teams right now in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Southeast Asia, in a country where there is no religious freedom, where it's illegal to share the gospel and illegal to convert to Christ. But we're going there and we're spreading the gospel because more than anything else, we want people to know freedom from sin and death and new life in Christ. So this July 4th week, I challenge us, church, particularly here in the United States, let's celebrate freedom we have, thank God for it, honor those who make it possible, but let us not be so American in our thinking that we miss the opportunities around the office, around the cookout, or wherever you might be to share the ultimate freedom that is found in Christ alone. This is the word of God on God and government, faith and freedom. So let's, let's pray. Oh God, we have so much to pray for. In light of all that we've just seen in your word, we, we, we praise you for your grace toward us and the freedom we enjoy. We pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters right now who don't have this freedom. Lord, please strengthen and uphold them. Grant them endurance and perseverance in their faith, we pray, and cause them to speak your word with great boldness that the gospel might spread through them even in the middle of persecution. God, we pray as you've commanded us to pray for our leaders. We pray for President Trump. We pray for Vice President Pence. We praise you. We, we pray for all of our leaders in Congress, judges, and state, national levels. God, we pray for your mercy, for your grace, that you would help them to restrain evil and promote good. God, we pray you would draw by your grace their hearts to your truth and your definition of that which is good. God, we pray for our lives. We want to be faithful, fearing you in the time and place you've put us. So help us as submissive citizens of a government and free servants of Christ. Help us to fear you, to show your love, to model good lives in a way that brings great glory to your name. Help us, we pray, to use our freedom in Christ on top of the other freedoms you give us, Lord, to magnify your name and to spread your love. May it be so, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.